what's up? It's Real Talk Tuesdays and Live Corporate, and this is your girl Shanisha. So today's episode is very intriguing. Uh, many of us, you know, we work within the corporate sector, whether, you know, <laughs> that's whichever industry that you're in, right? And within those industries, they come with various challenges. And many times we don't see the value in those challenges. Uh, it's kind of hard <laughs> to, especially when you're dealing with like a bad boss or your organization isn't really championing for you um, the way that you may have thought or been led to believe it would. So there, there's many things that take place and we're looking for you know, the good, or sometimes we're just looking for the bad. Like, okay, like, what is this night? What's coming next? What's going to happen next, <laughs> right? Um, so it's difficult to see the good or the value in these challenges, whether these challenges help us, you know, lock in with the mentor, um, help us, you know, better get, get ourselves better ready or get ourselves ready for, you know, opportunities that may come next or opportunities that we didn't think that we were quite ready for. You know, sometimes these challenges put us in position uh, to get ready. And, you know, when you get ready, stay ready. So you never have to get ready again. Right. So today our guest is going to really like dive in deep into the value of those challenges, our mindset, you know, how do we re really prepare ourselves in these challenges? How do we navigate these challenges? And then really looking at that value and maximizing it. So it's your girl Shanisha. Listen up, whether you're grabbing your coffee on your ride in to work this morning, <laughs> or if you're, you know, taking that small break, that little window, or you're just relaxing in bed, just listen to the sound of my voice. Like, tune in to Real Talk Tuesdays. It's always a pleasure to connect with you guys. Let's dive into this conversation. All right, what's up, y'all? It's Shanisha from Living Corporate, and we're back for another Real Talk Tuesdays. I'm excited uh, for this episode because y'all know that I am a, a pharma girl, a pharma bay, right? <laughs> and in this, I mean, many of us have experienced various situations when we look at talent acquisition, we talk about bad bosses, and just the whole experience of microaggressions of being a, a woman or a male, a black and brown person of color in the organization we call Pharma or just overall, just in organizations in general, right? So our guest today is going to take us <laughs> through her journey and then also just give us some really cool tips and insights to help us navigate these spaces. So let me just give you guys a little tidbit about our guest. So our guest was a teenager stuck in an underperforming inner city school in Philadelphia. She was living with her grandmother, which I know I love grandmothers now, living with her grandmother and in some cases also taking care of her, which I did too. I took care of mine too. <laughs> a chance in meeting with a mentor kicked off a journey that eventually allowed her to enroll in a private school outside the city. She went on to a prestigious college, the first born of her family to attend college. She majored in chemistry and went on to work in pharma. She has since co-founded her own company, Artemis Factor, a strategic project manager management firm with a deep experience in the pharmaceutical and biotech sectors. So please welcome our guest, Miss Katrina High. Hi, Katrina. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Living Corporate. How are you? I'm great. Oh, introduce me again. Oh. Like it's <laughs> It's not often that you hear, you know, your bio read back. That was amazing. I'm like, who is that person? It's you. This oh, is you. Me. Like, you've done really amazing things. And I think, I'm, like I said, I'm really excited, um, as we mentioned earlier, to just dive in to learn more about you. So could you share with us a little bit more about who is Katrina Pye? Absolutely. So since you sort of grounded us in the fact that you are a pharma girl, I guess I'll start there. So I am a homegrown, as I'd like to call it, healthcare leader, pharma professional. That's where I spent the majority of my professional career. Um, I am a Philadelphia native, a proud Philadelphian, and I currently still live um, in the city. I am a very spiritual person. I am a 
a person that prides themselves in giving back and helping lift as I climb, so to speak. I am a multi-passionate entrepreneur in addition to a healthcare leader. Um, so yeah, I think that's the nutshell of me. Which is beautiful, I'm right? A- so you mentioned about how you like to help people lift them and help them climb. Could you walk us through your journey from poverty to prosperity and how and how you shifted from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset? I know that's kind of like a two-on-one, right? So let's start with your journey from poverty to prosperity. Walk us through that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I like to caveat because there are a lot of people that take offense to, to poverty because it's more of a mindset mm-hmm. so that you know, from abundance, you know, from a, 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 a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. But I was very much poor. I grew up very poor. And there were chance encounters. And when I say I'm a very spiritual person, I believe that the universe sometimes places things, people, experiences in, in your life right at the right time. And it's up to you to recognize and take advantage of it. And you had mentioned a mentor. Um, that mentor came by way of an organization called, Phil- well, formerly called Philadelphia Futures, uh, rooted here in Philadelphia. It's now rebranded as Heights Philadelphia. And it was for first generation, low income Philadelphian students. And it was, I think in its second year when they found me or when it was awarded to me to be a part of that organization. Uh, And in its infancy, it just provided mentors, people that volunteered, professional people that volunteered their time to help a first generation low income student. And what that did for me was provided me access into a world and situations that I would not have otherwise been privy to. So you don't know what you don't know. And I think that began the the shift that there was more. So I'm not going to say shift from, you know, to an abundance mindset, but there was more than what I was growing up in. And so I'll 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 kind of start the beginnings of of that shift in mindset there. Um, And then there's just some innate, you know, abilities, intelligence and things that that God gives you that you have to take advantage of. So I was always very studious. Uh, School was important to me, but not necessarily in my family. I'm not going to say it wasn't important. It just wasn't um, something that the majority of the people older than me and my family aspire to. So there were probably only two high school graduates, my mother and my uncle, you know, prior to me. So I had to take the initiative to make school important, to try to do the best that I could, you know, in school. And and once you have that level of initiative and dedication, people take notice. And like I said, the universe then starts to work in your favor. No, I I definitely think um, for this current generation, we were afforded many opportunities that uh, our family members may have set up for us because it may not have been a priority for them then, but it was a priority for our future kids, right? So you went through this journey of shifting your mindset um, and you've had, I mean, an abundance of experiences that allowed you to be able to be well equipped for what's to come with more, Right. So what has been your experience using all of those experiences? So what has been your experience as a woman of color in pharma? Ooh. Mm. Being okay, being the only, being okay forging a path, whether you know it or not. Like if there was no one that looked like you um, to help bring you along, you have to be comfortable in spaces and places where you might be the only, especially if you are a woman of color in the sciences, in the life sciences. So even in in college, the university that I attended, Wesleyan University, there were very few um, African-American or um, brown, brown people in the chemistry program. And so that started my level of being comfortable, mm-hmm. being one of few, 
or or the only. Um, and then layer on top of that being a female in the sciences. So now fast forward, you are entering your professional career in the pharmaceutical world, and there are not a lot of people that look like you. And so there's a level of expectation, whether it's high or low, you know, it, it, it depends on who and, and what you're around, what is expected of you could be far beyond what might be expected of your peers or what is expected of you could be well below just because someone's doubting what you're capable of because they've never seen someone like you in the role that you're in. So I, I've experienced it on both ends of the spectrum. And I guess it's, you know, some level of microaggression, some level of just not knowing how to accept you or giving you your your dues or your props for the good work that you're doing because there's just a, a different level of expectation. So coming into the pharma industry was difficult for me in the beginning as a young professional, you know, the only person I know in a professional career like this. So there wasn't even anyone in my family who I could talk to about things that I'm currently experiencing or what might it be like, you know, once I get in into the arena, I like to call it the arena <laughs> sometimes. And I just had to work through it, you know, as, as I went along. And I think some of the earliest experiences looking back were the best for me at that point in time because it allowed me, and this is a, a, a term that's been coming up pretty recently, to gain agency over my career, over how I responded to certain situations that very much served me. So you're asking, you know, about the journey that very much served me along my journey and very much so now. Um having the confidence to start a business. Like once you gain agency over your career, because people are trying to knock you down or, or make it difficult for you, um, it, it definitely gives you, it builds a muscle in you early on that a lot of people don't, you know, they don't build. So those microaggressions or the under expectations, the over expectations put you in circumstances that, it's either you're going to take control of of how you respond to things because there's always going to be stimuli. You're going to take control over how you respond. And if you respond with, I'm going to take agency over this experience and advocate for myself or, you know, have confidence in knowing that where I come from and where I am now is not easy. It, it, you know, it does not come without sacrifices and challenges. And I'm not going to negate that because someone is trying to diminish my accomplishments or, you know, not give me all of the accolades I deserve when someone right next to me who might not look like me is doing the same thing and they're praised. So it's just how you remember who you are. And, and what you're rooted in and, and grounded in and not really let the environment around you diminish, diminish that, that flame. So that flame for you was definitely not diminished, right? Because if we think about <laughs> Artemis factor, like you were able, like you said, to take agency over your career and leverage all those experiences and your journey that served you. And I think um, for, for many of us, when we look at our challenges that we may have within our career journey, many times we don't see the value in those challenges because of how tough the experience may have been. So for you, you were able to find the value in those challenges and leverage those to create or co-found Artemis Factor. How, how did you do that? Like, What was the mindset for you to say, okay, I'm going to help co-found co -found a strategic project management firm because project management is like a big deal right now. Like it's huge. Mm -hmm. So you really yeah. tapped into like gold here, right? So how did this whole thing like come about? I love, you know, when people tell their story and, and most people think it's linear. Mm -hmm. 
was definitely not linear. It was a, a meandering and like I said, the universe putting putting things in place that you have to recognize and opportunize off of. So I'm going to give you sort of three examples of how things come together that got to Artemis. So very early in my career, I was a analytical chemist at a prestigious pharmaceutical company. Um, and my very first boss, um, I had a difficult time and someone had mentioned to me, so just imagine your first job out of college, you just bought a house, you just bought a fancy new car, you have responsibilities now, like I am adulting, you know, I'm fully responsible for, you know, for myself and I got that good job. You, you want to hold on to that good job and not mess it up. And you are representing in a space where there's not a lot of people that look like you. So there's that added pressure of, you know, you show up and you show out. But when your, you know, first direct boss isn't very supportive, isn't very um, patient with the fact that you're new in your career, you know, there's guidance and things that you inevitably need when you're new. Someone mentioned, um, and this was one of the first lessons of taking agency, was you don't work for that boss. You work for a company that has a responsibility to you. And once I was able to embrace that, I was able to be honest with people that could help me about what was really going on in my 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 situation. So I took agency over my my what was happening, decided to inform people who could do something about it, and they did. Um, and that was the first experience of, I have an opportunity here to, to make it, to do, to do something about what's happening with me. And I could either suffer in silence or make another choice. And so making that other choice, like I said, rooted me in the fact that I work for a company, not for any one person. And that company has a responsibility to me and I am going to hold them to that. I am here to do the best job that I can, but it should be in an environment that allows me to do that no matter what I look like, you know, or the circumstances um, that I come from. So that was one example. The second was as I was progressing in my career as a, as a scientist, you start to tap into what you like and what you don't like and what you're good at and, and what you might want to learn or experience that's new. And I had another boss who wanted me to tap into my softer skills. They, they noticed that I had a very good way of motivating people without authority, negotiating for things, getting things done. And that opened my worldview to, to maybe project management. So that's where the project management came from, uh, moving from, from science and making that pivot from a scientist to project management or even something other than, you know, being in R&D from a pharmaceutical perspective is hard. And so I made the transition into project management and through a series of circumstances, Artemis came about because of a restructuring and an opportunity. So I, having the career that I had, which was a great trajectory, I'd actually left R&D, got an MBA, went to the commercial side of the pharmaceutical organization to round out my, my skills in a project management capacity, experienced the restructuring, and had to decide do I stay with this organization in some other role? Do I take my show on the road and, and try my luck at other pharma companies? Um, or do I bet on myself? And once you have a few experiences of taking agency over your career, over how you um, develop yourself, it doesn't become as scary. And then there's also people that you surround yourself with. So there were organizations and other people in my life that gave me the confidence that if I do this experiment, it's always the scientist in me that are, that's thinking about things as an experiment. Um, and even if the experiment fails from a scientific perspective, negative data is still data. It's not that the world is going to end. So if I do this experiment of 
starting my own business, I have a network of of women and this, this network that I'm talking about is Women of Color in Pharma. It's an organization, a professional society for women of color in pharma that was just starting at that time. And just the sisterhood and the nurturing nature of the organization made me feel like if this doesn't work, this experiment doesn't work. I know all these women in pharma, one of them will help me get a job. Like I'll always be able to get a job. So taking a chance to start my own company wasn't as scary. No, that's good. No, that's good. Because like you said, betting on yourself, I don't think anyone can ever go wrong. It's scary as it may sound because of the unknown. But you know so much, you have so many tools and resources, like you said, people around you, like um, women of color and pharma, that could help support you and help you navigate those experiences, right? So we're like walking through this whole journey. Like, I hope y'all, <laughs> I hope y'all okay. Because <laughs> we're walking through this journey. And it's a, it's a really good journey because I don't think as many people, women of color, men of color, who have really have a desire and passion to be in this space because there's not many of us who are in this space, right? So being able to hear and share your story, I think is just as powerful as anything else. So you've been through this journey, you've experienced a company or a leader that was not as supportive. You, I want to go back about agency. Could you really find yeah. for our listeners, what does taking agency of your career mean? If you are not getting the support, the encouragement that you you need, oftentimes we don't realize it's not really the company's job to do that. So at a certain point, you have to take responsibility or, or accountability rather, um, which is the agency to do for you what needs to be done, whether that's building a network, other other types of groups, finding leaders in the organization or even external to the organization that can provide what it is you, you're looking for. So an example, the shift into project management was, wasn't as easy as I would have liked it to be. It was very difficult to, to make the jump. And then again, moving from R&D into commercial wasn't very easy, but I found leaders and mentors, and eventually you find advocates, which are different from mentors that can put you in places and in spaces and put your name in the hat or in front of people unbeknownst to you to give you experiences. But it's taking that agency to set up those relationships, to seek those opportunities on your own and not relying on the organization or your boss to do those things for you. No, um, I think many of us get caught up with the loyalty to organizations so much that when restructure comes, it feels like the world is ending. Because we have not, I think for minutes, we have not expanded our network enough and leveraged relationships outside. You are, you're hitting on, on, on a, on a gem mm-hmm. there. And I guess best advice that I could give to someone young in their career. And this, I, I hope this lands well is to get you a white male mentor <laughs> because how they navigate the, and I'll just use the, I won't even just corporate, how they navigate the pharmaceutical space to me is ideal. And they will tell you things that don't readily seem like they apply to you. But if you did apply them, you would go about your career journey very differently. Like I remember at that first company that I'm talking about, um, after I left, after, so after I acknowledged that the boss that I had was not working, was not going to work for me, and the company had a responsibility to help fix this, um, and I moved to a different part of the organization under new under new leadership. That leader said, "This company has no loyalty to you." You know, you don't have to have loyalty to this company. You need to do what's in the best interest 
for you that allows you to be a value add to the organization. Because number one, you have to know what your value proposition is in any organization to to feel safe and to feel confident in your ability to stay there. So once you know where where your value proposition lies, you then also have to know your days on the job are only as good as that value that you that you add. And so companies have no no matter how confident you feel in how secure a company is and how strong their financials are or what their R&D pipeline, you know, looks like there is no loyalty to you. You are a number. You are as valuable as you are that day. And they could replace you, eliminate your role, restructure as it relates to profitability for the company. Yes, this is this is absolutely true. This is absolutely true. So you have to be in a space where you're able to navigate that. I recall uh, when the pandemic took place, I said to myself, I am going to get myself together because I do not know which way this can go. We may not all be working from home forever. Uh, so I definitely leveraged <laughs> Tristan, um, guys, make sure that you ch- check out Tristan, especially for his tap in um, with Tristan. He does some really good tips, but I tapped in with Tristan to help get my resume and CV mm. and my LinkedIn together for me. And within six months, there was a restructure and many were not in place at that time, unfortunately, because they had been with the organization for so long, 15, 27, 32 years, and had not interviewed in a very long time. So to go back and to try to track down your entire career journey that you have done in the past 15, 30, even five years, it can be difficult to recall the success that you have had and the opportunities that you have had. Um, to be prepared to embark on a new journey that the company may be laying out for you, um, whether that's internal or external, (laughs) but laying out a new journey for you, it could definitely be, it could be scary and it could be a challenge for many. And as I'm speaking to you, you're definitely being a great value add right now because this is nothing but gems being dropped here. So (laughs) I would like to, I'll pause for a moment if you want to add on to that. But my follow-up question was, you know, how did you leverage your challenges to become a leader? Um, I'll answer that, but it was something that you said that I just want to make sure that I, that I build on and it's about network. <clears throat> so if you can make your network, even in pharma, cause pharma is a machine. Like there's so many different areas and a lot of us either get pigeonholed into one and we don't really know what's happening around, around, The company, so you don't know the real value chain of a molecule, I'll say, you know, that makes a a pharmaceutical company valuable. But having your network be as diverse as possible. If you're in R&D, have some people that are in commercial because, to your point, updating your, your CV, a lot of us get very comfortable. Pharma salaries, for the most part, are pretty, pretty good. You know, people people do okay. (laughs) You know, they keep the lights on and you get you be, get pretty comfortable someone one of my leaders gave me a nugget that for your birthday one of the best things you could do is brush off your resume just take a look at your resume every year on your birthday and take a look at it um and another was being an R&D and not really sometimes you don't toot your own horn you don't know how to be comfortable acknowledging the value that you bring and if you at any given point in time, your elevator pitch, if the CEO's in the elevator with you, if you can't describe how you add value, um, you might as well, you know, game over. But if you have friends in sales, they know how to chart how they bring value. That's, you know, how they get commissions and things. So if you talk to other people in other parts of the organization, you'll start to learn how to do some of these things organically um, so that you're ready. Mm-hmm. If something should happen and you talk to people in other parts in the organization that could be more volatile than where you are, you know that you should stay ready. Stay ready so, so you don't, don't get have. ready. And guys, please don't take this and only limit it to pharma. I mean, this applies really to any organization, 
what Katrina is adding. It applies to any organization. So please don't limit it or count yourself out um, for this Real Talk Tuesday. It, it applies to any um, any organization that you're in. So again, how did you leverage your challenges to become a leader? There was a, a certain point where, and especially as a Black female in the pharmaceutical company where sometimes you're the only one, you have to be confident in what you provide, the value that you offer. And along the way, you'll start to understand who you're influencing, how you're influencing, and you grow that leadership muscle one challenge at a time, one hurdle at a time. And that's not for everybody because there are some of us that have experienced so much trauma in these pharma companies that it has diminished our sense of self and and our confidence. But that's where networks come in that are nurturing, that speak to you and your circumstances in a way where you don't have to explain all the context around it we've all experienced it. So we know exactly what you're talking about and we can pour into you in a way that reminds you of who you are and the value that you bring, because it can be brutal. It can be lonely, especially when you start to ascend to to certain levels in the organization where you're the only one. And there just, there's just no one in that rare air for you to talk to, for you to confide in. And if you are a leader at a certain level, you can't be vulnerable. You can't have issues or you know challenges because you're you're the person. Um, but remembering we're human, we do experience microaggressions and and different expectations. Like that's real. And if you remember that and acknowledge that, like don't act like it's it doesn't mm-hmm. exist because people don't want you to think it does. it does. So you have to fortify yourself with whatever's available to you, organizations, that trusted advisor, mentor, um, to remind you of who you are, the value that you bring, and when it's time to leave, Mm -hmm. when it's time to exit stage left. No, that, no, that's real. But you definitely have to know when it's your time to be able to transition. And I know most of us get comfortable, like you said, with the salary, with the people, having brushed up on your resume. We start looking at all those things. It's like, oh, I could just stay here and work this out. Um, You mentioned about microaggressions and the trauma most times that organizations just in general could have on us, black and brown, um, people of color. How did you navigate the microaggression experiences? Like, how did you work through those, transition through those, I know we mentioned about the organizations not having loyalty to you, having a mentor. Like, what did you do to navigate the microaggressions that you experienced? Especially mm-hmm. being the only one yeah. to not really having someone to speak to about those things. Recognizing, so, you know, they say sometimes it's hard to be a bigot or a racist one-to-one, like person to person, you know, culture to culture, maybe, you know, it it, it happens, but one-on-one, it's very hard. So when you're in an environment where you might be the only, there are people, because people are decent at their core. There are people that you engage with where you know you might be able to trust them with, with certain information. So you find those people and then they leverage their network. To, to help you out of out of circumstances. So it takes a level of trust and a le- level of rapport building where you feel comfortable sharing something like, you know, when I told you when I was having that experience with my first boss, there was a level of trust I had with, you know, uh, managers above her that I got to the point where I said, I have to, to speak on this. What's happening to me is not fair. I have an organization that I work for and not a person that has a responsibility to me. So I have a responsibility to say what's happening or I can't hold anyone at fault for not fixing what I didn't express was, was an issue. Um, So I think there's a, a level of trusting people to a certain extent that they will be good humans and, and correct what is needs to be corrected. 
I think that's a, an amazing thing. Again, like you said, not <laughs> holding it in and being upset, saying no one is helping me and no one is doing anything for me. And and you yourself have helped many people, right? So when we think about valuable talent um, and helping increase diverse talent, um, what does that look like for you when we look at diverse talent, valuable talent? Uh, like, what does that look like for you? When, when, so when your journey wasn't easy, wasn't linear, wasn't ideal, it builds a muscle once again in you to appreciate what people bring in different forms and fashions. It, it, I, I don't always look for how I did it because I wouldn't even advocate for how, you know, how my journey was. So you, you can appreciate people that think different, that do things different. Um, or I personally, I do because I know it adds value. I know how valuable I am given my journey, which wouldn't have been ideal. And oftentimes you probably wouldn't pick, you know, my experience or my resume. And that has been true. Like even my journey from R and D to commercial in the cohort of people that I was probably competing against, if it wasn't for an out of the box thinker, they wouldn't have picked me. I wasn't the direct one-to-one ideal candidate to go into the role that I went into in commercial. I had no sales experience. I had no marketing experience. I had R&D drug development experience, project management experience, and an MBA. But I had transferable skills and confidence and soft skills, and I had a high um, EQ and learning agility and an outside perspective that's an out of the box thinker thought, you know what, she might come into this role and see things a whole different way. And she speaks another language. She speaks R&D. So she could translate to the commercial people in a way that if you've only grown up in commercial, you you can't. Um, and so I, too, am an out of the box thinker. I can take a chance on, you know, someone in a way that others who just, they only know how to pick a person that has done it, that has demonstrated, and they don't, they don't experiment. They don't, you know, risk anything. And if you do and pick what you've always done and picked, you'll kind of get what you always got. And so I look for opportunities to give people chances because I needed chances. Things just weren't easy for me. And I know what organizations, what patients got because someone took a chance on me and I was able to flourish and thrive. And so I look forward to opportunities to give those type of experiences because wasted talent is, you know, it's the worst. And you just don't know what patient could be waiting for that innovative thought that someone from this part of the the world or the or an experience set could bring to this problem because they've had a set of experiences that allows them to speak to this in a way that nobody else would see it that way. Oh no, that's good because I've always said for my for myself even all I need is just a foot in the door. <laughs> I may not <laughs> You may not find anyone that's may work as hard as me, think outside the box as me, come in with immediate impact. Just a foot in the door. You give me that and I will find my way to where I need to get to. That's, that's all I need. And I think um, for that's many it. of us, uh, when we look at uh, roles and opportunities, we count ourselves out for that experience. And I've always said, like, if you see the job, if you believe you can do it, if you look at the basic requirements, shoot your shot. Shoot your shot. And I mean... I never look at um, a previous role I was in. I think it was about 200 um, individuals that went for that role. And I think someone told me, like, like, oh, man, this is a very competitive role. They have about 200 people going for this opportunity. Like, are you going to? I said, they can, but they're not me. And I'm not speaking that, you know, oh, she's super. I'm confident in my skills and capability to know that I can go after this opportunity. So I'm not focused on everything else on the exterior. It's all about what I got going on the inside, right? It's a, it's a big deal. It is. I think there was, it's a Malcolm Gladwell book and I forget which one it is. And, um, and it, 
it's an example of the fact that it's like, I don't know how many different flavors of mustard. They're all mustard, but they're all on the shelves. There is room for your flavor right. of how you how you deliver things. Um, so you have to shoot your shot. And and you know, they would say men, unlike women, who only check three of the ten requirement boxes for a job description, will wholeheartedly apply for that job. Think not think twice about it. Only got three of the requirements. Women, we got to check all the boxes and add boxes underneath before we even think we can apply. And so it's that shift in mindset that women particularly have to work on. And then I think women of color have an an even bigger deficit. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I want to circle back really quick um, because I think many people may be in uh, in this space of experiencing bad leadership how can how can bad bosses be helpful because i know many times we look at it and say oh they're taking down our career they're not helping elevating us they're pigeonholing us right but how can bad bosses be helpful to your career development that shift in mindset Ooh, so bad bosses could help remove you from a situation that you would flounder in far too long, (laughs) you know, far longer than you're supposed to, and then experience erosion of your confidence, like just breaking you down. So if a boss is bad enough, you will leave. And that might be the best thing for you. If a boss is bad enough, you will speak up. There, So we talk about in pharma, this middle management layer. So you could have C-suite folks with all of the best intentions. And then you have a younger group of talent that wants to rise up and wants to be the best selves they can be. But then you got that middle management layer that are sort of set in their ways. They're used to what they're used to. And it's hard to break that either from the top down or the bottom up. And we often ask, how are they still in their jobs? Like, how are they getting away with this? I think people don't advocate for themselves. They don't express what's, what they're experiencing because maybe they don't feel like there's anyone in the organization that is going to help them. Um, and that's not always true. That's not like if we don't speak our truths about what we're experiencing or what we expect, we won't get any change. We won't get anywhere. So it was when I started acting like, not at like a white male, I don't want to say it like that, but but having an expectation of the companies that I worked with to provide me a good work environment to fix the things that were not working for me, that I started getting changed because I started vocalizing, you know, what was happening. I started asking for things. I wanted these opportunities. I, I would like for you to help with my educational assistance, or I want to start this ERG or be a part of it. I would like for you to sponsor women of color and pharma if you really say you're about D, E, I, and B. So I, I, I'm, I'm asking for these things. I'm an employee of this company. Help me. <laughs> help me. Absolutely help me. And I think you have helped yeah helped us throughout this entire dialogue, right? Because I think the conversation has been so genuine and real, and there are so many points that we have touched on. Are there any key takeaways? I would say I totally understand that I sit in a seat of privilege. So I, so we have this conversation and it is not lost on me that I've lived a little bit. I've gone through some challenges, experienced some things, made some choices that allows me to speak with confidence about how you can handle things and do things. It is not easy in the arena when, when you're in it. It's not. So it takes a level of confidence. It takes a supportive network around you where you know you have a safe space to land. If you put yourself out there, it takes a a level of expecting things to work in your favor. Like work doesn't always have to be hard or challenging for women or for people of color. Don't expect that. Don't accept that. Um, You can speak up. There are parts of the organization that 
are supposed to make sure that you can do your best work, be your authentic self. Like they say all these things, hold them accountable to it. Hold, hold them policies up and say, but isn't this what you say? This, this is on your website. And if they don't hold true to it, leave. Your degree, your tacit knowledge, everything that you've gained up until that point doesn't diminish. You take that with you, go somewhere else. No, that's that's genuinely, uh, genuinely good points and very much real because many times we don't uphold them to that. And then we get frustrated, upset. You may complain. <laughs> you're not showing up as your best self. Um, you're not showing up as your most authentic self in conversations. And then it just starts, to, you should start to sit, um, I think sit in turmoil. So I think it's always best, like you said, to advocate for yourself, one, speak up hold up those policies and make sure that they're following through. Because like you said, at the beginning, we're really setting the trend or leading the path forward for someone else to come behind us. And if you're not creating an environment that's conducive for yourself and others like you, this is really just an ongoing cycle of failing experiences just again and again and again. Like you said, that experiment, right? <laughs> just- Interesting. It's interesting. You know, you say that. So the mindset that some of the millennials and the younger generation have is already one of expectation. Awesome. And, and and they, what they expect in terms of the working environment, uh, self care, work life balance is very different. Yes. And it's it's refreshing to to see. And it's also very interesting to see that mix with you know, all of the different ages we have in the workforce now and some people that aren't used to that thinking it's entitlement, like just how how it gets labeled. Um, it's very interesting. But, you know, you you have to have an expectation of how you want to be treated in the workplace. If you're in a workplace that does not treat you that way, don't feel stuck. You have agency. You might have to put a plan in place. You have to have a network in place. You have to network. You have to know your value and how to articulate it. Um, and I'm saying all these things. There, there are people who came before you that know how to do this and know how to do it really well. Mm-hmm. Find those people. Learn those skills really quickly, and then you'll you'll your confidence will be on on a thousand. Like you will feel unbreakable, mm-hmm. unshakable when you can articulate your value. You know you can just pick up. And go to this other, you know, pharma company because you're following where your value would be appreciated. And that's another point that I probably didn't emphasize enough. When you network and when you talk to people in different parts of the company, know the business. Don't just do your job and go home. Know what makes the company valuable, how the company's trending and shifting. You can sometimes get a sense of, when the layoffs might be coming. Like if that pipeline starts thinning out in R&D, you know, ain't going to be much for them to sell in commercial. And you can probably know, okay, maybe the sales force is going to be winding. If a drug isn't performing the way that the street might expect it to, um, there could be some, some changes coming down the pike. So wherever you are in the organization, know what are the value drivers for that organization? Know what are they focusing on? Are you in that area? If you're not, you know that and know what that could mean. I definitely think you have to be tuned in. Um, you have to be tuned in. I think I've, I created a, just being super strategic. So I created a, a plan for myself to say each announcement for a new role that has been selected, whoever that candidate is that's been selected for that new role and just looking on work days, going on kind of seeing what's out there, make sure the press releases, any organization announcements that I'm attending and listening. And for anyone that was new um, in a role that I was interested in, just putting time on the calendar to get to know a little bit more about them and what their experience is in this role and their previous experience. Because if people, I've always said, if people like to do anything else, talk about themselves, right? So it's allow that person to share their experience and their journey and begin to build your network and stay tuned in to what's happening so you can know how to leverage your network and know when it's time to pivot, right? So it's it's a lot that can be unpacked with that. Uh, mm-hmm. Katrina need to charge y'all a fee. <laughs> no. <laughs> <Because> she, <laughs> this is a lot of good 
information that you guys are getting. And again, please do not just limit this to farm. This could be applied to all organizations, right? You just have to make sure that you tailor it for what your experience is. Um, so Katrina, I know I done held you hostage for some time. <laughs> And I just thank you for your time because this is really good conversation. Like you're really sharing a lot. And I think our listeners can really benefit from this um, and definitely help them navigate them spaces because we are getting ready to roll into a period for many organizations, especially pharma where layoffs may be coming here soon. Um, so they can de- yeah. definitely leverage this. Um, but I want to make sure that I give you the opportunity to any shout outs that you would like to put out there. Anyone you like to recognize. Oh, my partners in Artemis Factor, Tara Miller, Shannon Keenan, um, women of color in pharma, and the president, vice president, uh, and founders. So, President Dr. Charlotte Jones Burton and uh, vice president, former vice president Pat Cornett, current vice president Monique Adams, um, Heights, Philadelphia. Yeah. All right, y'all. Well, hey, should give everyone a shout out. <laughs> Again, Katrina, it's been a pleasure having you with Live in Corporate. You're always welcome to come back for another time to tune in for Real Talk Tuesdays. And that's our show. Thank you for joining Living Corporate Podcast. Be sure to follow Katrina High on all platforms that she's available on, right? And make sure to follow us on Instagram at Living Corp, Twitter at Living Corp underscore pod, and subscribe to our newsletter through the Living Corporate website. If you have any questions you'd like for us to answer and read on the show, make sure you email us at Living Corporate Podcast at gmail.com. This has been Shanisha, and you have been listening to Katrina. Hi. Katrina, before I t- close out, where can people reach out to you if they would like to connect with you? LinkedIn is probably my most active platform, but I'm also on Instagram. I'm on Facebook and I will soon be on TikTok because some of our younger staff is saying that's where we need to be. Um, And I thank you for this opportunity to to share and to pour into your listeners. And I do encourage people to, to listen to this. There were a lot of things that you can't do it all at once. You can't boil the ocean. So I gave you the entirety of my career and different things that I, that I did at different points, but all of the things make a difference. Absolutely. All of them. Absolutely. And it all yeah. works together for your good, the good and the bad. So it all works together. So Katrina, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Again, this has been Shanisha. You've been listening to Katrina and we've been talking about value and changes. So you guys take care. Listen in again for Real Talk Tuesdays. Peace. Peace. All right, guys. So you guys have heard, I mean, nothing but gems being dropped here, right? Katrina really just dove into like all the good stuff. There was so much fullness and richness of what she's saying. Like, listen, like really take agency of your career. Like how powerful is that? And then really leveraging your network and redoing your resume or CV and you know, getting comfortable with the uncomfortable and making sure that your organization upholds its obligation and duty to you. I don't think many of us really realize that. We say, hey, they're not doing what I need. I'm out, right? Maybe that's a millennial on me. I don't know. <laughs> but really working through those challenges and finding the value in them and maximizing yourself. And though this, you know, was from the perspective of pharma, this applies again to any organization, right? And it applies specifically to you. Like it applies to you. Find the value in your challenges, maximize your network, maximize these challenges and maximize any and everything that you can get out of it so that you can be successful and continue on your journey to greatness, right? So you've been listening to Shanisha and Miss Katrina Ha. So it's a pleasure. Again, thank you guys for tuning in to Real Talk Tuesdays. We'll catch you next Tuesday. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? 
Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.